Tim's are one of the most recognizable, if not the most recognizable boots in the world. And they were the second boot I ever cut apart. Since then, I've cut apart 300 pairs of boots, $60,000 worth of footwear, and I've changed my opinions on a lot of things. So I thought it was time to revisit the legendary Timberland Premium 6 inch waterproof boot to find out is it actually a boot or is it just like Dr. Martens and Carhartts? Is it actually a decent work boot? Are they comfortable? And are they as good as the other boots for the price or is it all just hype? And is there anything special about the Tims that makes them so popular or are they just popular because they're popular? So we buy a bunch of boots and shoes pretty clearly and sometimes we have to buy them from sketchy sites. The problem with that is your card information is on a whole bunch of sketchy websites because it only takes one day to breach. They can charge stuff to your credit card before the credit card company catches it. And then you gotta spend like five hours updating everything across the internet because they just one tiny little data breach. And that's where Aura, the sponsor of this video, is really handy because they can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit an opt-out request on your behalf. And brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it super hard and it's a pain in the butt, so let Aura handle it for you. And the cool thing about Aura is you can try it for free for two weeks by using the link in the description, and it's really easy to set up and you don't have to download 50 different apps to do some of the most important things that you can do for your internet health, which includes parental controls, antivirus, VPNs, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. And you can get everything at an affordable low price because it's all bundled together. And I personally love those password managements because I just have like, I have like a hundred different passwords. I'm always like, anytime I just try to log in, I have to try like all the different versions of all those different passwords. So let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so that you can focus on your other tasks with peace of mind because you can either let people continue to exploit and profit off of your private information, or you can go to aura.com slash roseanvil to start your two week free trial. And if you don't like it, you're not out with anything, but if you do like it, your internet activity is a lot safer. And so check out the links below and be sure to use that link because that's how we get credit for these ads and that's how they sponsor more so that we can show you guys the stuff you wanna see. So thanks again to Aura. So to fully understand Timberlands, you kind of have to go through their history because it is a unique history and it's part of why it's so iconic. So in 1952, Nathan Schwartz bought into the Abington Shoe Company located in Massachusetts. The company specialized in workwear for the New England working man and was trying to make a waterproof leather, which was providing difficult for the time. And during this time, Nathan bought several shares until he controlled the entire company. Good move, Nathan, respect. And then in 1965, injection molding was invented, which was a huge game changer because it meant rubber soles could be fused and bonded to the leather uppers without any stitching and while keeping it as waterproof as possible because there's no threads connecting to the inside that the water can seep through. And then in 1973, the Abington Shoe Company launches the Timberland Waterproof Boot, coming in a variety of colors, including this yellow Nubuck, which is synonymous with Tim's. And then in 1978, the Abington Shoe Company officially changed its name to Timberland. And then through the 80s, Timberlands became a fashion statement in Europe, starting with the Italian boutique shops. Then in the 90s, sales soared because Tim's had become the shoe of the New York rap scene. Next, in 1999, the Timberland Pro line was launched. And then in 2005, Timberland starts the LWG, a leather working group, a group that audits tanneries and gives them a grade based on the environmental, social, and government's considerations. And then in 2011, like a lot lot of the solid brands of the past. The VF Corporation buys Timberland and VF also owns Vans, the North Face, Dickies and Supreme along with a ton of other companies. So uh, once again, a workwear company becomes fashionable, then it gets pur purchased by a giant corporation and the same old story repeats itself over and over. But does that hold true with the Timberlands or have they maintained their quality? Because these are the famous Tim's because these are the premium six inch waterproof boot. They weigh one pound, 13 ounces, retail for $210 and they're made in the Dominican Republic. And the way that Timberland positions their product is the original waterproof boot. The all season style gives you tireless waterproof performance and instantly recognizable work boot styling. Other essential features include 400 grams of warm down free permaloft insulation, a padded collar for comfortable fit around the ankle and a rubber lugged outsole for traction. They're responsibly made too with an eco-conscious leather upper and rebottle fabric liner. Timberland supports responsible manufacturing of the leather through the leather working group, which they own. So convenient. It's not that there's really nothing wrong with that. It is cool that they did that. It's just funny. And so there's some, there's some tricky wording going on there. They say work boot styling, 
not work boots. You know, there's certain things that they're kind of dancing around. So I wanted to just kind of inform you guys on how I'm going to judge this boot and what boots I'm going to compare it to to come to those conclusions. So there's six boots that, I, that I'm going to loosely compare them to. So first is the Ariats, which are around $150 to $200. They're one of the most popular cemented work boots for most people. Blundstones, they're kind of the comfort king at $230. Jim Greens are a more affordable, like really good value work boot at $180. At Thursdays, they're around $200, and Carolina's a traditionally made comfortable boot is right around $230. So right around the same ballpark. So we're not gonna directly compare them, just kind of loosely so you guys can know where I came to those conclusions. So what about the leather? Well, this is the classic Timberland Nubuck leather, and really, to me, what popularized Nubuck. And what Nubuck is, it's a regular full grain piece of leather, but all they do is lightly sand the top surface of that grain, removing imperfections and giving it that really uh, microfiber look to it. It doesn't really add a whole lot to it. They're still gonna scratch just as easily. They're still gonna scar and split just as easily, but you just won't notice them as much. And the cool thing about this leather is it's, it's a waterproof leather. There's not a waterproof lining. This leather is what I'm assuming is infused with silicone, making it impermeable by the outside, but also from the inside. And so it makes it a little bit hotter of a leather, but it is a true waterproof boot. Unlike most of the waterproof boots out there that have the waterproof lining, that after 100 miles, you've bent them so many times, you get little holes in it, and it's just not as durable, and it's a lot hotter than even a, a silicone-infused leather. I really do like the way that Timberland waterproofs their boots. And then we cut a little cross section out to see how much grain it had. It had plenty of grain, and it's a fairly thick leather too, at two millimeters thick. Usually for work boots, we see it right around 2.5 up to 3.5. But two millimeters is, is still within a decent boot thickness, just not a work boot thickness. And we also burned it just to see how, how it performed. And the thing about Nubuck, it, it's not as flame resistant as a flesh out or rough out leather, because you can see the difference in this shot. So Nubuck really is all about the look. Even the benefit of it not showing scratches is all about the look. And to test how strong the leather is, we did the puncture test and it took 95.5 pounds. So pretty good results. Number eight out of the last 47 boots that we've tested. So is the leather up to par with the other boots in this price range for various purposes? I would say it is. It's a pretty good leather and it's a famous leather and it's a very dependable leather. But just because they say it's a waterproof leather doesn't mean it actually is. So we wanted to test it. So we put it in the waterproof tank and after five minutes, absolutely no leaks. So at least for the brand new pair, they do seem pretty watertight. And that's where this waterproofing type excels down the road, like I mentioned, because you don't wear holes in a lining, the, the leather itself is waterproof. So unless you get a hole in the leather, this is probably gonna stay fairly watertight. And then if we start looking at the inside of this boot, one thing I really do like is that it's it's not fabric lined, which means that the counter cover inside at the heel, where most people wear out most of their boots and shoes first, is backed with leather. There's not even a seam going up the middle. So it is, it is gonna be fairly durable in the heel. And I really like that, especially for a work boot. You know, it's not gonna be the thickest leather. It's not like a dedicated counter cover, but it's better than any fabric and any fake leather, in my opinion. And then the vamp is lined with their fabric, which is allegedly made of 50% recycled bottles. And to give you a quick material science minute on how they take plastic bottles and turn it into a fabric, it's a fairly interesting process. And a lot of companies claim to bake fabrics out of recycled bottles. So how do they actually do it? Well, the, the plastic bottles are shredded into little teeny flakes, which removes any excess liquid that might be trapped. Then they sort the clear plastics from the colored plastics because the clear plastics don't have any dye in them. And so it makes them a lot more valuable because you can turn it into basically whatever you want versus the pre-dyed bottle flakes. And then they remove the stickers and the lids by floating the plastic in baths and the lids float and are strained off the top and the stickers are removed by putting a, the bottles in the caustic soda bath where they peel away and are strained off the top as well. And then the clean plastic is put into large ovens to dry and then those dry plastic bits are put through a large screw machine that heats up the plastic until it melts. Then it's pushed through a big strainer to extrude large lumps of molten plastic into threads that can be used in different materials. Then the threads are combined and stretched multiple times while being heated to make them strong enough for fabric. The threads are then shredded to produce a fluffy cotton-like material which is bundled up and shipped off to be spun and woven into the final fabric material material and that long process is how they take bottles and turn it into fabric. So I think it's a pretty cool process how you start with a bottle and end up with a lining in one of the most popular boots in the world. And obviously there's a lot easier ways to do that with better materials, but it is cool that even though Timberland's this giant corporation, they still push for the leather to be eco-friendly. They're still putting some semi-eco-friendly things into their boots. So it is nice to see, even if it is a very labor-intensive process.
And then if you pull out the insole, these are pretty comfortable insoles. You know, they're nothing special, but they are, they are nicer than a really cheap one. And that's where the good stuff ends. Because as soon as you start looking on the inside here, you can see right underneath the insole is a big old slab of compressed cardboard. Not what you want to see in a work boot, especially right underneath the insole. You can see that the shank is riveted to it, so it's a, clearly a steel shank still. Um, and that's why they use that compressed cardboard. But the preferred material would be a leather because it's just as strong as a compressed cardboard, but it doesn't bend and, and start delaminating as soon as you start wearing it. Fortunately, that compressed cardboard only goes to the end of the shank. So where you flex the boot most, it tapers off and goes to a really thin fiberboard material. It's, it's really thin and it's already kind of flaking up a little bit. So underneath the insole is a little bit of a disaster. And that's why the more money you spend on a boot, the more leather that's gonna be in your boot. And it's because it's more expensive, but more durable and a better material, especially for a work boot. But what about how this boot is made? Because a lot of people think this is just a cemented boot where they glue the outsole on, but it's actually a direct injected rubber midsole where the upper is put in a big mold in a press and liquid hot rubber is injected into the mold, fusing everything that that rubber touches together, making a really, really strong bond. And then from there, I think the outsole is glued on after that. I don't think it's part of the injection molding process. And they're also different hardnesses because the midsole, this lighter color is a 60 shore A versus the outsole is a 70 shore A, which is pretty similar to regular work boots. And we also did the puncture test and it performed pretty decent, 94 pounds. So right in the mid range of everything that we've tested. We also did the bar drop test to see the responsiveness of it. And it bounced up about six inches. So a little bit on the lower side of the middle of the arc of boots that we've tested. So this outsole, it's gonna be durable, grippy, and the sole is not gonna come off anytime soon, at least the midsole. I don't, I'm not sure about the outsole being glued on, but it is gonna be really hard underfoot and resole on these is a pain in the butt. And since that liquid hot rubber is fused to just a thin piece of fiberboard and the upper is wrapped into that, it makes it nearly impossible to tear the outsole off without completely destroying the boot. And that's why a lot of cobblers will just cut it off and then sand it flat which makes the resole not as strong and it just causes issues. So it's just not the most resolable boot. You can do it, but nobody's, none of the cobblers are gonna want to do it. And for 210 bucks, you might as well just get a brand new pair. And with how hard this rubber is without anything else on the inside besides this to give you squish, it's just a hard boot underfoot. And especially if you're expecting it to be a comfortable boot for a long day on the construction site. And so some mixed things here and there, like the upper is pretty decent, but the sole I have some questions about. So let's cut this thing in half and see what else is on the inside and give it a final verdict. All right, we got it cut in half, and if you're not subscribed, consider doing it. It's just one little click and it makes a huge difference for us, and it's what allows us to spend the money on all these boots to show you what you're spending your hard-earned money on. So let's see what's inside. So just like we expected, a really thin fiberboard, and you can see it's already kind of falling apart and disintegrating, it's just, for fiberboard even, it's it's cheap. So not really on par for this price range, but it does have a metal shank, which is fairly on par for this price. But the problem is, I just realized this, that that shank is not worth anything. I literally just bent it in half. So for work, not on par, even though it is a steel shank. It's just a cheap steel shank. And then you have this little block of foam in the heel, which will make it a little bit more comfortable, but it is kind of odd that they use a recycled foam for that. It's not odd if you know Timberland's history with the tannery and like the recycled materials and all this, it makes sense, but it is recycled at the end of the day and it's not the most high quality material, but being sandwiched between the two layers of rubber, it's not 
really doing a whole lot anyway. And that's part of why these boots are so hard underfoot because you can see exactly what you're standing on. It's just all hard materials. So now that we've seen every little aspect of this, is this actually a good work boot? It should work just fine, but all the six boots that we talked about at the beginning, comparing it to this, all those are better options in my opinion. So it should work, but there's a lot better work boots out there. And is this actually a good boot or is it just like Docs and the other boots where they've sold out after they sold to a bigger corporation? It's a little bit of both because it's a bit, it's a little bit highly priced for what you get, but it's not egregious like Docs and Carhartts, but they are still relying on very old techniques that were developed 60 years ago, similar to how Docs did it, but at least with Timberlands, they've got plenty of other modern options that even look exactly like this with modern materials. So you can't really fault the whole brand for this, maybe just this boot. And then are they comfortable? Nothing really inside this boot points to it being comfort comfortable except for the insole. And if you remove that, everything else is hard as rocks. And then are they as good as the other boots in this price range or are they all just hype? Well, if you compare it to the other boots, the Ariat's at 150 to 200. The Ariat's in my opinion are better and they're cheaper. Blundstone's more money, but they're more comfortable and better materials for just 20 bucks more. Jim Green's around $180, better and cheaper. Thursday's at $200, your more casual version, if you're considering these a casual boot, they're better materials and they're cheaper. Carolina's a comfortable traditional work boot. Once again, I consider those more comfortable and better and you get more for your money. And so comparing it to all those, these are arguably the lowest value and the least comfort and, and high quality materials per dollar than any of the other boots in the price range. So it's clearly not just all hype because there is some decent materials, but hype seems to be its strongest attribute. And we've seen people who are happy to pay for a, a tribute boot like the Danner Mountain Light because there was nothing wrong with that boot. It was just a little bit expensive and it had the silhouette and the look of a classic popular boot. Same thing with this. It's a little bit more expensive and it is a tribute boot. And I can't believe I missed the entire Tenacious D joke during that video. So here it is. This is just a tribute. Tenacious D joke, it's a tribute. And because that's exactly what this boot is. It's a tribute to an old school technology and a group of people that have loved this boot for, for over 30 years now. And so if you understand at the end of this video, this is not a work boot. It's a tribute boot. It's, it's essentially made for people who are gonna wear them around the streets. Basically, this is made for New Yorkers is what I'm getting at because it's not made for work. It's not made for hiking. It's not made for anything but to look like a Timberland on your foot and it's not crazy overpriced. It's just a little bit overpriced. And to me, that is okay on occasion because some people are willing to pay just a little bit of extra money to have the iconic look. But also at the end of the day, don't expect this to be a work boot. But like I said, this is not necessarily a a Timberland review across the board because we've seen a very similar silhouette in the other Timberland video we did that had all the attributes that this is missing. So let me know what you guys think and what your experience has been in Timberlands. And if you disagree with anything, I'd like to hear it because I think these things are hard as rocks and I do not find a whole lot of value in them aside from them being Timberlands. So thank you guys for everything you do. And if you're not subscribed, consider doing it because it helps immensely. It's the one way that we are able to afford to buy these boots and have the editing power to make these videos entertaining and informative. And it's really fun to do. So thank you guys. See ya.